Hi, everyone. So I'm Lily. Uh, I work on um, our medical imaging team in Brain. Uh, and uh, in a previous life, uh, I was a doctor, and I've been repurposed as a product manager at Google. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the projects that we've been working on uh, in our group is uh, using uh, deep learning for uh, retinal imaging. Um, in particular, we are looking at a disease called diabetic retinopathy. So that's, other than a mouthful, it's actually also the fastest growing cause of blindness uh, in the world. And it's because uh, this is a complication of diabetes. Uh, and diabetes, uh, um, there are 415 million people in the world with diabetes, and each one of them is at risk for going blind uh, due to what we call a DR, or diabetic retinopathy. Uh, the key to preventing blindness is regular screening. So every guideline sort of worldwide uh, recommends about once a year screening. And it's because um, this is pretty asymptomatic until you get to a point where there's irreversible vision loss. And at that point, it's a little too late to intervene. Um, and so uh, this is done by taking a picture using a specialized camera uh, of the back of the eye through your pupil. And then a doctor uh, grades these images. We look for these little little hemorrhages and little spots um, on the image, uh, and we grade them on a sort of five class scale from no disease to uh, the end stage, which is sort of proliferative DR. Uh, in many places in the world, uh, including in India, where sort of our story originated, uh, there are just simply not enough doctors to do this task. So in, 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 in India, there's a shortage of 127,000 eye doctors. Uh, and because of this and other sort of systematic issues, about half of people actually suffer, suffer vision loss before they're even diagnosed. And so for something that's completely preventable, this is sort of unacceptable. And here is a picture of um, uh, one of some of people who are uh, waiting in line to get screened. So even if you get to a place where there is screening, there's a long wait, uh, there's long turnaround time. Uh, and so a lot of people end up being lost to care. Um, the other issue is that even when available, doctors are surprisingly uh, variable. So uh, here in this graph, uh, each color represents a different class of the category of disease, and each row is a patient image of that fundus image. Uh, and each column represents an ophthalmologist. Uh, these are US board certified ophthalmologists, and we had given them this sort of test set uh, when we were kind of trying to you know, attack this problem uh, to see uh, you know, what the grades were for, uh, for each of them. And as you can see, uh, when there's no disease, there's you know, pretty good agreement. There's one person who thinks otherwise, but everyone you know, is, it, consensus is, is there. And then, of course, you look at, uh, at the end stage when there's sort of proliferative disease, there's good agreement there too. But in between, there's actually a lot of variable variability and disagreement about where this should actually fit, even though there are pretty well-known guidelines. And it's because human beings in general just aren't super great at, you know, um, at being very precise about what we see in that image. Um, and of course, you can see the two highlighted ro rows there in black. Um, these images got every grade in the book, right? So depending on who you saw, your management would be kind of different. So, uh, so, you know, a little bit more about that later. Um, so where we thought we could help was, let's train a model. Uh, and so we actually, um, built a labeling tool. Uh, we started off with 130,000 images, uh, and we've gotten much more since then. And we hired an army of ophthalmologists to help us label. Uh, and uh, from our 54 ophthalmologists, we got 880,000 diagnoses uh, for these images. And you can see from the previous slide why we did that, because um, sometimes it took up to seven reads to get some, something consistent. Um, then what we did after we got these, this data cleaned up and labeled, we kind of um, used our trusty, dusty inception network that works for a lot of image recognition tasks, from cats to puppies to melanoma and now to DR. Uh, and we um, trained it to detect sort of these five class predictions, but we also asked it to predict, you know, sort of housekeeping things that might be important for a clinician to know, whether or not uh, this image is of sufficient quality for grading, whether or not this is a left or right eye, sometimes we get confused, uh, and also the field of view, which is um, like what, what part of the retina you're actually seeing. Uh, and then we built a front end to this. I'm going to try a demo here. Uh, this is literally what um, I call a 
toaster, we try to drag and drop something. I don't know actually how to, how do I move the cursor to, oh, there we are. Okay, so I'm gonna open up a web browser and hopefully that works. And so I'm gonna drag one of our images um, over. I can't see it, oh, there we go. And it's analyzing. It should be faster, but the demo gods, oh, it's cooperating. So, uh, so here we are able to tell you that, you know, there's proliferative disease here, there's no uh, what we call DME, which is a, a different type of uh, uh, DR. And we are saying that this is somewhere between moderate and severe, and this is in, indeed um, a, something between moderate and severe. So um, I kind of showed you how it works, like, you know, a case by case basis. But then, you know, um, how does it work sort of over a lot of images? Well, um, here we actually published and shared sort of how we did this work in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, and we, this is one of the tests or the validation sets that we used. The model was not trained or, you know, or, or tested on this previously. And out of, you know, 9,963 images, we actually, um, you know, we predicted whether or not it had referable a disease. So the uh, y-axis is sensitivity, the x-axis is one minus specificity, and um, our algorithm and the two black dots, if you can actually see it, is um, uh, in black, that's our algorithm, and then the little colored dots are US board certified ophthalmologists. Um, and up and to the left is good, and you can see that essentially that we're very close to most of the ophthalmologists in terms of performance. Um, and in, in fact, if you look at our F score uh, and you compare the algorithm's uh, F score to that of the median ophthalmologist, we're sort of in the middle of the pack. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, we also decided to publish in JAMA was because we believe that, you know, engaging the medical community is really important uh, to get these technologies out um, into the hands of the people who can actually use them. Uh, and so, you know, it, it was actually quite well received. You can see some quotes um, from, you know, real doctors uh, about, about our work. And so we're really excited about that. Um, so how did TensorFlow help us? Well, uh, it, it, every step of the way, I think, you know, it helped us really start with quick prototyping, right? So we had starter architecture, pre-trained models, and we actually were able to try out different sort of, uh, like, vari variations of neural networks. And we actually found, I mean, we literally found that Inception V3 at this point uh, worked, worked the best, but we could, we could try out things very quickly. Uh, and we also pre-trained. So we actually pre-trained on, you know, the, the you know, uh, classic ImageNet, uh, and we found there was a boost in, boost in performance there. Um, so it also helped us to uh, experiment at scale. So, you know, GPU support and fast training, um, this allows us to run all these different experiments, different sort of uh, labeling, uh, you know, if we had new labels or different labels, it kind of helped us do that. Um, and finally, what I think is really important um, is that it really allowed our team to reinvest sort of the efforts. So the blocker was no longer in machine learning and in, in training, right? Uh, that's always been like, you know, um, it's, that's been hard to do, um, and, and if you look at what we did here, we actually played, applied very straightforward ML techniques here. And what was the magic sauce was actually finding the right problem, getting the data, getting agreement about what, the, what was in the image, uh, and then you know, we were able to use sort of this uh, package, these tools that were able to sort of allow us to train the models uh, that actually performed really, really well. Um, and that also then allows our team to validate the, uh, focus on validating the algorithm and figure out ways to deploying it into healthcare systems, which in itself is a huge challenge. So what's next for us? We train a model, it works really well. Uh, and now, well, now we need to actually uh, clinically validate it. Uh, we've been working with uh, two hospitals in India, Aravind and Sankara, uh, and they're running clinical trials of the algorithm as we speak. Um, actually, Aravind's finished, and they found essentially the same results that we were uh, slightly better than sort of the average of their ophthalmologists there. Uh, and so what we're doing is working with a, a fellow Alphabet company, Verily, uh, that's a life science focused company, um, and a hardware maker called Nikon. Uh, you may or may not have heard of that little company, um, but the um, idea is now that the algorithm works pretty well, the bottleneck becomes the hardware, right? Because we need a specialized camera to take these pictures. Um, so we're working with um, the hardware manufacturers to essentially figure out ways to deploy sort of lightweight hardware uh, that's easy to use, um, et cetera. So, uh, you know, one of the, you know, taking a step back, one of the main reasons I got into medicine was, you know, uh, I was an MD-PhD. 
Uh, and so I really was very excited about bringing sort of breakthrough science from bench to bedside. Uh, and it, there's a part of you when you go through training and your PhD and you're like, this is never gonna happen, right? Because like, it's just not possible to solve these problems. Um, and with TensorFlow and sort of all the work that's been done here, it's actually possible to do that. It's possible to train algorithms that really can help um, physicians deliver care where people need it most. <laughs>